I'm pleased to introduce the second panel to you today. Unfortunately, one of our panel members, Jackie DuPont Walker, is stuck in a board meeting and so may be unlikely to get here until the very end of the panel. If she does make it at the end, we'll definitely give her the chance to talk on the important issues around housing and, and transportation that in, interact with opportunity. Um, she is, just let me introduce her in any event, even though she's not able to be here right now, that she's currently a law, uh, the LA Metro board member. She's president of Ward Economic Development Corporation. Um, let me introduce uh, Angela Johnson Mazaros, who's the staff attorney for Earth Justice, and you have her bio online that you can check out. We have Meg Palasak, who's the co-founder and chief executive officer of Synergy Academies. And then we also have Salan Jivarjis, who's currently the senior advisor at, for the, at the Center for the Study of Social Policy, which is focusing on issues of mixed income neighborhoods. After um, being in the Obama administration, he's found a new position to serve his community well. He's going to provide some introductory remarks um, for the, the panel uh, and also to help moderate the conversation here. But before the panel begins, I wanted to provide a, just a few remarks and this intersection between data and empowerment and community engagement. And we, uh, during, in, in Luis Alvarez Leon's presentation in terms of the data portal, we wanted to talk a little bit about kind of how to rethink how we, how we view and measure neighborhood opportunity. And so I'm just gonna quickly kind of run through this. You know, the context, most of us are fairly aware of Raj Chetty's work and his colleagues that have noted that different trajectories that, that kids have when they grow up in high opportunity, quote unquote, versus low opportunity neighborhoods. Um, but most uh, appreciate there's no obvious policy to accomplish what was done in the experiments and such that he said when he moved kids from a neighborhood of 40% poverty to a neighborhood of 10% poverty. That somehow we can't simply just do that as our policy option. So what next? However, embedded in that language, I've already done something that we believe is the wrong thing to do, right? We get our words confused. We think high poverty equals low opportunity or high poverty equals high risk and vulnerability. This need not be the case, but it does imply that we have to think about things a little bit differently. So when we're trying to measure opportunity, you can look at lots of different indices that are out there that are trying to do what's important to do to make, try to go across a broad set of data and kind of summarize it in a single metric. You might look at issues around affordability, um, prices, around opportunity, and you have different ones that are out there that could be referenced there. When we at the Center for Social Innovation tried to tackle this concept, we realized that these measures are actually quite tied to income or poverty. And if you do statistical analysis on it, it really tracks almost exactly with those measures. And if that's the case, what we're capturing around neighborhood opportunity is just the outcome, right? What we really want to measure is access to opportunity pathways. And yet there haven't been data that have summarized that as concurrently. So what we have done is to try to create such an index, and this index will be available on the Neighborhood Data for Social Change platform. I'm going to give you a preview today which focuses on issues around jobs, issues around access to affordable housing, issues around transportation, and issues around access to capital, right? And in this, we've developed this index of opportunity for the region, and we can look at it, and if you look at the lightly colored green, those are the places that, according to the index, have the lowest opportunity, and the dark colored green, the places with the highest opportunity, according to this metric. We can toggle this and kind of say, well, how does this track with median income? And you can see there are some similarities, but there are some interesting differences. Even if you put them side by side, you, it's not as apparent, but you can see swaths where there's opportunity in places where you also might have relatively middle median income for the region. Um, what's really interesting, though, is when you dive down into neighborhoods. When you do that, and just to kind of point out three neighborhoods, two of in all of these, you can see the median income 
is quite low, whether we're talking about South LA in Florence or Watts or in Koreatown. But what's distinct is that if you switch to this new way of measuring opportunity, which has jobs and capital and all these things embedded in it, you can see that there are a piece of Florence that does have higher opportunity than other pieces of Florence because of these access points. You see pieces of Koreatown, in fact, that actually have very high levels of opportunity despite very low levels of median income. So that provides, again, a provocative question around what are these drivers of opportunity and access. Um, we can also develop a, an index of risk and vulnerability to try to capture those things that prevent opportunity or prevent access to opportunity. So there could be issues of, of inadequate access to healthy food, issues of, of not having health insurance, not being able to get to a health care facility quickly, issues of being exposed to elements in the environment that we know hurt your performance in school and your ability to, to grow issues around public safety, around traffic collisions, crime rates, et cetera. And once again, you can kind of map this out and see where are those places where you have the highest risk and vulnerability and the places where you have the lowest. And again, there's some overlap between this and poverty, right? But you can tell also that they don't quite, you know, kind of overlap each other and that there are some differences in places with the highest poverty here are not necessarily the places with the highest risk and vulnerability, but there are these points where you see higher risk and vulnerability in other places. And again, if we dive down into the map that I showed before into a neighborhood, this shouldn't be surprising that in looking at people below the poverty level in Watts, Florence, and, and Koreatown, there's a, there's a mix, and, and then these are areas in South LA with relatively high poverty. But when we look at risk and vulnerability, there are also some elements that Watts doesn't actually have the highest levels of risk and vulnerability and according to this. So in some ways, this is provocative. It asks us to look back at those access points or those risk factors in a different way and think about from a public policy standpoint, can we actually think about it in a new way rather than the outcomes? Um, so that's my introductory, a few little maps, a few pieces of data but to really, again, as we're, the theme of today is about empowering neighborhoods, that it's not, data alone is, is, is a tool, but not anywhere close to sufficient around that. We're gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues who have, have done work in the community to make sure that, that there are, are opportunity pathways in all neighborhoods. Last year, I had the pleasure of being with you uh, for a conference on activating markets for social change, and we were, visiting some of the same themes. I was in my last year of leadership and service in the Obama administration, uh, and I spoke on behalf of the president, the secretary, and others. Today, I assure you, I do not speak <laughs> on behalf of the president, Secretary Carson, or any other folks uh, affiliated with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. I uh, am honored to be here at this auspicious occasion to reflect on the 20, last 25 years and to think about what lies ahead uh, for L.A., as well as all of the L.A.'s of the world. Uh, my obligation is to frame this conversation. I'm going to try to do that uh, on Opportunity Neighborhoods, and I'll... Uh, do a little bit of a reprise, slight reprise of some themes that we visited last year, as well as an extension of those same themes, share a story from the Baltimore region with some common juxtapositions that many have already reflected on today, provide an admonition for all of us on the conditions we are now in uh, and what that requires of us. So first, a little bit of a reprise. I began last year's conversation with, I think, some of the perennial questions that confront us when we're thinking about building and restoring opportunity neighborhoods with a comprehensive and integrated toolbox. We have to think across multiple frames, policies, interventions, investments, often at the same time when we confront and try to address opportunity neighborhoods. And you saw Gary mention many of those frames that have to be reconciled. I said that we have to start by asking what success looks like, and I think our panel and all day today will talk about some of those success measures. We have to be willing to ask why more often with the expectation of more rigor. 
And I repeat some of the questions that I asked last year for myself and others today. Why does the change we seek to make among people and in places not happen with the persistence and frequency across the range of outcomes we seek? Why are distressed neighborhoods often so difficult to turn around with benefits that accrue to all of the residents? Let me extend from those comments last year, from last year's episode with a little bit of a sequel today. When we are thinking about race, class, culture, and all of the seeming divides of society, to quote Rodney King, can't we all just get along? Have we come together over the last 25 years in our neighborhoods, or are we splintering apart? As we continue to recover in pockets around the country and even here, where market influences and cost of living are increasing, those rent burdens we talked about in quite relief here, is our increasing racial and income segregation just a fact of life? Are we destined to be separate where our zip code will dictate our life chances? When we get physically proximate with each other as we use many of these development tools, do we really share space and life together and have we learned how to neighbor and live together? When access to opportunity is the reality of some people in some neighborhoods, but not all, do we believe, and does our policy reflect, that zero-sum propositions of winners and losers is just the way it is? So let me illustrate this predicament, not with an LA story, but by sharing a story from my own region, the Baltimore, Washington region. 25 years ago, as we've been talking about, LA was burning, and a couple of years ago, Baltimore was burning. Each story had police brutality featured within it that all of us know. Each story saw an uprising where neighborhoods that were racially identifiable burned, South LA here and West Baltimore back home. This past Sunday, I was in Sandtown in West Baltimore to attend church with my family. As I asked the pastor about how things are going, he spoke about the challenges and struggles for the church and for its members. He spoke about what was happening and what had been witnessed in the news and what was true about that and what was not true about what was witnessed in the news. When speak people spoke about what was happening in West Baltimore, and you heard this as it was covered in the news, the same refrain emerged that all of us know very well. Signs of progress with affordable housing, but it wasn't enough. Little to no access to jobs, crime and safety issues still a challenge, poor schools, few to no amenities, disinvestment, segregation, and concentrated poverty. Assets to be leveraged among the people, to be sure, but low opportunity abounding. Does that sound familiar? I went home after church to a different reality, and I confess that to you, about 15 or so miles away. And many of us in our work make these similar treks in this work. As a family where I work in DC and my wife works in Baltimore, we live in Columbia, Maryland, in Howard County, right in between the two cities. Helpful for the commute, different reality. I live in a high opportunity place. Columbia is one of the oldest planned communities in the country, intentionally planned to be a mixed income and mixed race by Jim Rouse and the founders. It's not perfect by any measure, but lots of access to jobs within the county and elsewhere. Schools are among the best in the country. Safe neighborhoods and streets, access to amenities. But, and this is a common refrain, it's also very expensive. And NIMBY issues abound, 
particularly as it has been a target community for resettling poor public housing residents from Baltimore. In a place like Baltimore or LA, it doesn't need to be 15 miles to differentiate high opportunity and low opportunity neighborhoods. It can be blocks where the difference in life expectancy as it is in Baltimore can be 15 years. Living 15 years longer because of where you live. As I pivot to the panel, let me conclude with a story from my time in the administration and an admonition for all of us. Many here know that the Obama administration worked hard on opportunity measurement and the opportunity agenda. In one way, fixing a broken regulation called the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule. Anybody know about it? AFFH. I had the pleasure of working on that rule in the administration and some of the innovations related to it in the administration. We knew the reality of opportunity in the United States and that re issues of regional equity play out. And we sought to incentivize with that tool regional looks at these issues. We knew that community engagement, as Gary and others have talked about, was going to be key and that people needed to be equipped with data and evidence on racially concentrated areas of poverty and these access to opportunity measures and worked to produce measures of school quality, job access, transportation access, health quality, in order for those communities to make better decisions for themselves. We also knew, as all of you know, that as we were putting forward the AFFH rule, the people would come out of the woodwork, calling AFFH social engineering, government takeovers of local decision making, failed experiments. When the AFFH rule went out for public comment, I'm not trying to bum you out, but my comments, uh, my colleagues shared with me that three quarters of the public, thousands upon thousands of comments, three quarters of the comments were pure racist screed. That deep, dark underbelly revealed itself again in the election. We all know that. We persisted and persevered with the AFFH rule and it came out. With every jurisdiction in the country responsible for submitting their analysis of what is happening and how we can get on a pathway to opportunity for all. I provide that background and that admonition to myself and to all of us because these are difficult times where we are, that we are in right now where our connections seem to be fraying, separating, splintering, while at the same time, as people have already testified today, we are coming together to confront some common elements of lack of access to opportunity. And my question is, will our coalitions be big and diverse enough to matter? We must finish the work of opportunity neighborhoods for all, economically and racially integrated places that represent, I think, the best of our vision. We can build the infrastructure. I've been in that business, Jackie and others on the panel have been in that business, but we must continue to heal and reconcile across our differences, where hate, fear, distrust still pervade in so many pockets from around the country. And we won't have sustainable neighborhood opportunity if those factors exist. That, I think, is our unfinished work. You are well on the way here in LA, and as California always does, will teach, I think, the rest of the country. And that's the work I have the pleasure of continuing to lead now. I'm honored to be in this struggle with you, and I'm honored to be a part of this panel. And with that, I'm gonna sit. I wanted to give each of our panelists uh, an opportunity to uh, offer their own reflections. And as we were preparing for the conversation, knowing that this was uh, a 25 year uh, uh, commemoration opportunity, to also integrate your own personal stories for what, ha what that moment existed and how, the, how powerful it was for you all. So let me hand it off to you, Angela, for those personal reflections as well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, in 1992, I was a student here at the USC Law School. And I remember 
that day well. I appreciated the comment about yesterday, how yesterday is so permanent, right? Um, so we were on campus studying for our final exams. I was a first year law student and we were studying for our constitutional law exam. They announced that the verdicts were gonna come out and they brought a television into the library at the law school for us to watch the verdicts. And as we watched the verdicts and were disappointed, the news started to show us the activities that were unfolding around the campus. Um, as you all know, the USC campus was very close to what was going on. Campus security came into the library. They told us to wait there until they come back for us. And we waited and we waited and it got dark outside. They came back finally and told us that um, the roads south had been closed. I lived in Harbor City and I, went, and I realized at that time I wasn't gonna be able to go home. I was gonna have to stay on campus that night. They found um, dorm rooms for us and I stayed on campus that night and I went on top of the parking structure and I could see the flames all around the campus. And it was a powerful moment for me studying law and constitutional law. Mm. Um, I decided then that I needed to do something that was going to allow me to be more deeply involved in the issues that our communities face than I had imagined when I came to law school. And um, I will just tell you that we went back finally, we took our constitutional law exam. And the question on our constitutional law exam um, was a hypothetical that proposed the notion that perhaps um, a black man was beaten by police <laughs> um, who ultimately were declared, uh, were, was, um, the police were declared not guilty. There were riots and we had issue, mm. you know, spotting around constitutional law issues and all kinds of different um, things associated with that. And I will tell you that was the lowest grade that I got in law school. Mm. And, and reflecting on that, I think ultimately, I guess what I would say is, we had a different notion of what inclusion might look mm -hmm. like, right? And how that conversation might impact me as compared to maybe some of my other classmates. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I uh, went on to my second year of law school. I ended up taking a class in civil rights from Mark Rosenbaum, who's an amazing civil rights litigator at the ACLU. And one of the issues that he brought up was lead poisoning. And in the conversation about lead poisoning, I came to realize some very important things about um, impact on people of color and the environment and what those things look like. And this is a time when we were talking about affirmative action and in that place was where we were having conversations about how your life experience could be different because of your color and because of your class in a way that we weren't allowed to talk about that anymore because of the firm of action pushback, right? And so I decided, ah, environmental justice, that's me. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up doing environmental um, work. And I just wanted to put this um, conversation in a little bit of context. I have four quick slides I wanna show you. I came to realize that the environment is actually everywhere. It's every place where we live, work, learn, play, worship. Um, and it matters. And so let me just show quickly. So I love Google. And so this is Google telling us that USC is about a half a mile, three minute drive, seven minutes if you take the bus, um, to the corner of Jefferson and Budlong. And if you drove there, you would eventually get to this intersection. This is the corner of Jefferson and Budlong. And this is what you would see. If you keep driving, you would see this people, this wall, this building. Richard Parks knows this place quite well. And looking at this as you drove or walked by, you might not realize that right behind this is this. Mm. And this is a site where they extract oil. Mm. And, um, and this is the local environment for all of these people. And this is important because what data does is makes the invisible visible, right? And so I have just three quick things to say about this because the timer person is going to be, be mad at me if I go on too long. And so here's what I'm going to say. 
I really appreciate that we expand the definition of what it means to have an opportunity-rich community to include the environment. It is incredibly important. Opportunity includes the opportunity to bodily integrity, mm. right? So we've heard the refrain, I can't breathe, in the context of mm. police brutality against black and brown bodies. And that same notion, I can't breathe, is an important notion in terms of impacts to black and brown bodies as it, turn, as it applies to things like this. The second thing that I will say is the data sets that we have right now and the data sets that are included in the tool that we talked about this morning don't include this. We don't have this kind of localized data. And it is incredibly important because I will tell you that there are people who are living in this community. There are houses right here that literally are two feet away from that drill site. And people will tell you that they did not realize what was going on there. There are people who live there and don't know. And I will, t and I will also tell you that not, o not only are there the immediate issues you might think apply to this um, site, but because of um, what's um, already found in oil, and because of what they truck to this site to extract oil from this site, this community is being exposed to incredible um, air toxics that matter. They matter in your immediate life, they matter in your long-term impacts, and they matter in terms of your reproductive health and the impacts on, 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 the, um, on the next generations who live around these sites. And we don't have the information that's available in order to track this kind of thing. The third thing that I will say is, um, to me, this really raises the question about um, how do we get more localized data? And the conversation this morning when we were looking at the PowerPoint present, the, um, the database that's in alpha on its way to beta, I was excited that he chose an environmental um, um, measure in order to talk about this, it's important. And he talked about how data, um, this kind of data is, that's directly re relevant to people's lives is important. Um, and that's true. And I wonder if it's you know, crowdsourcing and other kinds of ways for people to show what's in their communities is an important component when we think about how do we capture what happens because the fact of matters is just not generally available. So, um, so there's a big conversation that can be had around this, and I'm um, using more time than I was allotted. <laughs> but so I will wrap and say, um, back, to my, back to my beginning, I started in this trek around lead, and we've had lots of conversations about lead recently. And as I um, sit here and talk with you today and think about what has changed over the years, um, I mentioned to my colleague this morning that this morning, um, Teen Vogue posted an article, um, which was a Q&A with me, talking about why lead poisoning is an environmental justice issue. And I thought, 25 years ago, I'm pretty sure that Teen Vogue was not writing um, <laughs> articles about lead poisoning and using the word in their headline, environmental racism. Right? There has been progress. It's important progress tied in part to our elections and tied in part to the notion that we are somehow in this all together and that um, you can look fabulous and be bright. Right? <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Meg. Yeah, I'm going to share. Um, when race first became apparent to me at, at a very young age. So I am Taiwanese American, and I am the first in my family to be born in the US. And I remember at the age of four, I went to go visit my family in Taiwan, and I remember my relatives talking to my parents about me, and they were asking, what's wrong with your daughter? Why does she look like a foreigner? Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't look like us. And, and that left a big impression at age four. And then I went to school in the East San Gabriel Valley um, of Los Angeles, suburb of Los Angeles. And back in the day, it was predominantly Latino and, and Caucasian and a little bit of Asian. And now it's predominantly Asian now. Um, but when I was growing up, I was one of the few Asians um, growing up. And so then I'm coming back from hear, seeing, hearing my family say, what's wrong? What's wrong with you know me? 
And then I'm hearing my non-Asian friends saying, you know, go back to your country. You don't look like us. Um, and I'm going, I was born in this country. <laughs> what country are you talking about? Um, and that all happened very early. Um, and so race has been a big part of my passion because it, it definitely affected me growing up. So fast forward to April 1992. I was a senior in high school, and I was deciding where to go for college. And around April, May is when you tell universities that you're going to commit and where you're going to go. And one of my top choices was USC. And so we turn on the TV, and you see the neighborhood around USC burning. And so family and friends are telling me, don't go there. It's not safe. Um, but me growing up, my passion's always been I've always loved to be like the first responder. I want to be the first one there to help. And so when I saw the city you know, struggling and because of race relations, my heart, instead of fear and wanting to run away and not go there, my fear is drawn, my, my personality is drawn to it. And I said, you know, I want to go to USC because I want to be part of the solution. I want to figure out why did this happen and how can I help. So I went to USC. And I studied psychology because my passion's helping people. And uh, when I graduated, I decided to continue the path of helping people. And I got a master's degree in college student um, administration to work with college students. Because again, as a college student, my personal identity was, was such a journey for me and, and, and not always a positive one. And it was a tough journey for me personally. So I wanted to help other college students who may be struggling um, with personal issues and personal identity in college. And so I um, ended up getting a job. My first full-time job was um, out of college was with USC. So I stayed in my alma mater and worked for the Viterbi School of Engineering. And I eventually moved up the ranks there. And one of my jobs was the Director of Engineering Career Services, where I helped undergraduate and graduate students get jobs. And this was 20 years ago. And I didn't have an engineering background, but I saw that this was where the world was going. I, I, my eyes are wide open. This was amazing. I was helping students get amazing jobs around the world um, in engineering computer science fields. And um, I also saw that it was where the world is going. It was where our country needed to go in terms of education. But I also saw that we were so far from it because I was passionate about the inner city schools and how there were not enough of those kids getting into USC, let alone studying engineering. And the kids who got in, a lot of them were, were dropping out. And so I realized I cannot help fix 13 years of, of a K-12 education that a lot of the students were lacking some of the skills they needed to compete at the university level. And it wasn't diverse enough. There were barely any Latino and African Americans in the engineering field at the time. There were barely any females. Um, and so my husband had quit his job in business at the time and became an elementary school teacher with LA Unified. And he was sharing me the amazing things he was doing with his students. He's very good with computers. So he was already teaching inner city kids at a young age computer skills um, when people weren't really doing that yet in the public schools. And so I was inspired by him to say, well, again, my personality draws to wanting to be part of the solution. So I said, I, I love what I'm doing, helping students get jobs but I want to help more students who wouldn't be able to even be here in the university. So I quit my job, and I became an elementary school teacher in South LA. I taught first and third grades at 66th Street Elementary School, which feeds into the Fremont High School, um, feeds into Fremont High School. And so my eyes became wide open to the challenges of our urban public schools. And so one day, my husband came home um, from a conference, and he happened to learn about charter schools. And so he said, you know, we're both passionate about wanting to help kids and help the inner city. And we love what we're doing in our classrooms, but we want to have a bigger impact. And so 13 years ago, we opened a school called Synergy Charter Academy, which is an elementary school. Um, and uh, I'll just fast forward. We now have three schools. 13 years later, we have an elementary, middle, and high school. And our, the reason why we started a charter school is the charter school law says that teachers community members, parents can start a public school and be an incubator best practice. So our goal as former district teachers is to have a charter school where we can share and prove that through opportunity like education, providing a high quality, free public education, 
that students and children in South LA could outperform students in other communities. And so we're really excited that within the first couple years we were able to prove that. So in 2013, our elementary school was named the best urban elementary school in America. It was the number one charter elementary school in the state of California. And we're 100% South LA kids, um, and our kids are outperforming kids in Beverly mm -hmm. Hills. Um, and so it's pretty amazing stuff. So we picked our name Synergy because we really believe about the power of working together. And we really were naive about the politics. We really thought we're going to get these results, and then people are going to come and say, this is amazing. We want to do this in our schools. Um, unfortunately, if you've heard about the politics lately, there's a lot of politics now between charter and traditional district schools. And um, unfortunately, there are folks who are like, we want to shut down schools like mine just because we're charter schools. And, um, and that makes me really sad, and we can get into that in the Q&A, because my goal has always been to not be competition, though I know there are folks out there who believe in that model. My, my, the way my um, MO is about collaboration. And so for me, the charter school route was always about being able to prove that this can happen in South LA. And once we did that, how do we get all schools to become amazing schools? Because we got you know, a lot of work to do. We have a lot of competition around the world. I really want all kids and all teachers to have an amazing place to learn and to work. And so um, I think as we talk about opportunities, my, I guess my thought-provoking question is, instead of us thinking about you know, charter versus traditional district schools or public versus private schools, at the end of the day, what's the end goal? Shouldn't it be about opportunities for all children? And what's the best route for that? And then let's talk about, OK, then what's the pros and cons of these different opportunities instead of automatically shutting down things without fully understanding what we're doing and the potential consequences of, of the politics and the infighting. Thank you, Meg. Uh, I, uh, you can clap. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to do an opening question for us um, uh, that I'll probably reframe a little bit given what you both put on the table. We are missing uh, Jackie to be a part of the panel who would have given a set of examples I know on housing and transportation, her work on homelessness, her work on the invisible homeless uh, here, and hopefully there'll be some pathway and lunch for folks to hear her story when she arrives. Um, I've been struck by this morning uh, the maps, the data, the tools that have come out. Uh, but in our conversations as we were preparing, uh, you both have been in the knowledge business in different ways and have access to those things, but you're both doers. So my question is, when it comes to opportunity neighborhoods, do we, uh, do we have a knowing challenge? A, a doing challenge, both? What's your take on, and in the doing part, I know I've struggled with uh, how much of the gaps that exist are that we don't have the will to change in the way we need to. We don't look at those images, Angela, that you put up and say, you know, that was a pretty pretty image with lots of shrubbery, right? But when you look above, it causes you to act. So knowing, doing, both, what, what's your take on that? Well, I think there's always more you can know, but you just gotta do it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's this notion that if you just told people how bad it is, then see, then they would, they would stop being bad. Mm -hmm. And I think what we do know is that's not right, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we have plenty of information. We know plenty about what's going on. Do we know everything? No. But we know plenty about what's going on. So I think really the issue here is a doing issue. And mm -hmm. I think you're right when you say that this is about the will to do it, mm -hmm. right? The political will to do it. Mm -hmm. And that, that starts to bring us into conversations about who's valuable mm -hmm. and what does it mean to be valuable mm -hmm. and how does value manifest and often um, communities like South Los Angeles, the people who are living in places like um, near this drill site, they're simply not valued. Mm. Um, and it's, I have a, a friend who's an engineer, and he used to always tell me, Angela, you can engineer your way out of anything. Mm. It's just a question of how much money you want to spend, mm. right? Um, and I think the fact of the matter is that we don't want to spend the money. Mm. Because when you do the cost-benefit analysis, um, there's the costs 
um, are too high. Mm. And I'll, I'll just wrap, and I really am looking forward to hearing what you say about this, Meg, but I will say that we have moved into this space even more firmly now than before, that there's um, a price for doing something mm. and the cost that are associated with not doing something. And we figured out lots of tools and mechanisms for capturing the price. Mm. We don't have adequate tools and mechanisms for talking about the cost. Mm. And that again is where data gets to be important because as we you know, fill out this picture about all the costs that are associated with not spending those dollars, perhaps mm. we can encourage people to move in the right direction. This particular, Meg, as you uh, uh, take on this question, uh, it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful point that you're mentioning. And I know for any of us in this audience, when we think about um, you know, what are our models for uh, costs that are avoided? because we took the right steps. We invested appropriately. We actually, to Dow's uh, 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 statistic, we invested in kids because we saw the virtuous cycle about what it's meant. But for some reason, we're not oriented in that, in that kind of way or that we need to get reoriented that way. Meg? Yeah, I think it's definitely both knowing and doing um, are, are some of the challenges. And um, with that said, sometimes not knowing certain things is a good thing because <laughs> going in naively and like just being pure passion, you know, helped us get through a lot of the challenges as well. Because if I had seen all the challenges ahead of time, you know, it could be pretty overwhelming and daunting. Um, so you know, you kind of have to balance <laughs> that as well. But um, I, you know, I think like Angela said. Um, I was naive that I thought people knowing and seeing like, oh, you, you can make a difference that people would believe. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, some of the mantra that I've heard is when we got the high results, some people said, oh, those, those aren't South LA kids. They, mm -hmm. they can't do that. Those aren't the same kids. You must be like taking all the top performing kids. You might be serving kids from another neighborhood who are driving to your neighborhood. And I was shocked because we put in a lot of effort and had kids who were the majority multiple years below grade level, and it took several years to get them at or above grade level. So it was a lot of hard work, um, all kinds of behavior and academic challenges that we had to overcome. It's totally possible, but it is not easy, right? And so I think people saw our results and thought, oh, that's too easy, because they didn't see what it really took to get there, and then they just assumed it's, it's not possible. And that, I think, was the most shocking for me, was like, people knew we had the results, we were in South LA, and yet, some people refused to believe that this was possible in South LA, and I just was floored. Because um, I thought 13 years later we'd be a lot further along and have these strong partnerships with the district and that we'd be able to have amazing schools. Because for me, it's not about trying to shut down schools or trying to make look schools bad. For me, it was like, we got work to do. We, just, we have kids, mm -hmm. and these are families, and this is our country. And you know, like, I was just like, fueled by, by that. Um, and so I was just really shocked by, by I don't know if it's, you know, love, love comments from the audience on, you know, like how can we get through that mindset of being stuck in, in a certain mindset? Um, with that said, like another interesting thing that I've learned is I, I had put so much of my heart since uh, graduating from USC into inner city work. And I, we now have some of our students, since we now have uh, middle and high school, some of our students are here at USC and, and all over the country at universities across the country. In another year or two, we will now have college graduates who've gone through our schools. And um, one year, a year ago, one of our alumni came back and she had just finished her summer bridge program at UC Irvine, which is predominantly known to have a high Asian American population. And my students are, are predominantly Latino. Um, and then some African American as well. We're about like 95 to 98 percent Latino, and about two to five percent African American in, in my South LA schools. And um, so one of our Latinas came back for the summer, and I had heard she was thinking about not about dropping out of college. She hadn't even gone to her fresh like her first class. It was summer bridge before freshman year, and she was already going to drop out. It. And so I saw her over the summer, and I said, "What's going on?" And she said, "Well, I went to orientation." And she said, you know, it was like mostly like people who didn't look like me. And she said she met this one um, student who's an Asian American female student who was asking her questions. And I said, well, what'd she, what'd she say to you? And so she said, well, this Asian student said, you know, well, what, kind, what part of LA do you live in? And so my Latina student said, what do you mean? And the Asian said, 
are you from the, the good part of LA or the bad part of LA? You know, and I'm like, what? I'm like, oh my gosh. So then I'm like, what else did this student say to you? And so the Latina told me, she was like, the Asian American student said, so what kind of Latina are you? What do you mean? Well, are you the kind of Latina who gets pregnant before you're 18? Wow. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I don't know if my students know that I'm Asian American because I, I you know, don't necessarily like put that out there with, um, with the students. So I said to her, I'm like, in case you don't know, I'm Asian American. And I said, I am so sorry. Like, we are not all like that, you know. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to say she, she, she enrolled and she's a sophomore now at UC Irvine. So our Latina is still there at UC Irvine. But that aha moment for me was, was we, we need, it's not just about the, the maps of like the low opportunity areas. We need to figure out what are we doing in the high opportunity areas to bridge these race, you know, um, mm. you know, er, you know, uh, misperceptions that I just naively over the past 20 years thought we were making progress. Mm. And as we can see in our country and the world, oh my goodness, like we have a lot of work to do. And that, you know, made me think about, it's not just about putting all our eggs into the urban settings, but we, we have a lot of work to do in all areas of our country. I have lots of follow-up questions, but we don't have a lot of time. And I'm getting a cue that I'm supposed to go to Q&A. So uh, let me open up the floor. And I have someone who's an air traffic controller who's waving hugely, who I think will probably need a mic before you start talking. But please introduce yourself and then fire off your question. Uh, hello. My name is James Nash. Uh, I just retired from CBS News Department. And with your comment. You've got a news voice, let me tell you. <laughs> I just got back from Cuba. That's from the room, sir. <laughs> well, the point I want to make is sitting here listening, I realized that things that I know, because I was with CBS for 40 years, mm. there was a guy named Jaime Escalante. Mm. He was at Lincoln High School in East Los Angeles. And from the mm, you guys know about him. Mm -hmm. Garfield. Gar I'm sorry, Garfield. <laughs> And he went through hell after he got his kids uh, uh, to a point of being excellent. I believe it was physics or chemistry. I'm not correct. Calculus. Calculus. <laughs> See, I'm a newsman, OK? <laughs> There's so many stories in my head. But, but I remember that the, the, the result of that was that he resigned. He had so much pressure put on him from different parts of the community because he took people who were considered non-educable. Is that a word, non-educable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I'm listening going, you know, um, I graduated from college in 1971 and I'm hearing things that are repeating itself. Mm -hmm. And from this awe I heard about Jaime, there, there needs to be more discussion about the history of racism in education. And we're with a group of educated people, people are studying. Um, you need to go back to about 1890 and see how all of this is a framework that is over 100 years old in this city about this. And believe me, those of you who are gonna become PhDs, you too in 20 years will probably have the same issue of helping people who might be the new immigrants, whatever. So um, that's all I wanted to say is that I, it just caught me, what you were saying. I'd love for Meg and Angela to respond. I'll do a quick response on this. Uh, just to validate for any of us in any of our roles, and Meg, you were just speaking about um, how important what we believe actually is. And I will tell you much more to say about this during lunch, how how belief played out in policy making uh, in very real ways, where you could confront people with data and evidence, but the belief, what they wanted to believe, filtered what they saw. Uh, and it's something, Meg, to the point you were just raising about how do we get people to, uh, to uh, rethink what they believe. So Meg, Angela, response? No, 
Be hopeful, Andrew. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, you have to be hopeful to keep doing the work, yes. right? So you always think that things will get better. I think that the pathway to that is finding like-minded people mm -hmm. and doing what you need to do in order to take care of what needs to be taken care of, right? And so I appreciate the notion that helping people to see the light is always important. Mm -hmm. And so I try to incorporate that in what it is I'm doing. But I will tell you that I believe that um, the time and energy that you spend trying to get people to see the obvious <laughs> and agree with the right is time that you're not spending getting it done. Mm. So balancing those two things mm. I think is important. Mm. Not to be Debbie Downer, but mm. there it is. <laughs> um, what I've kind of reflected on over the years, what I've observed and learned and, and try to model is it's, it's relationship building. It's not always overnight that a lot of things I, I tend to want to do things overnight and want to do things big, like just, you know, we got a lot of work to do, you know, <laughs> like we can't wait, we got, you know, um, to take care of this quickly. But also I've had to learn that it doesn't always happen overnight and it doesn't always happen that wide scale quickly and that we need to be patient and that, it, and that you can do it one person at a time, even though it may seem slower, it is possible. And it's all about building bridges and taking that initiative to, to cross, you know, those communities and have ways of different groups to connect and learn from each other and interact with each other so that we're not intent like sometimes it's unintentional but we have been unintentionally for years living in bubbles mm -hmm. and thinking that i thought we were more mm -hmm. mixed and, and a lot further along and so i think we need to really open our eyes and be more um, intentional with how we spend our time and how we teach our children and our family and our, you know, talk to our friends. We have, oh, we have five minutes. Great. One more question. Ah. There's someone back there. Oh, there are folks in the back oh. as well. Yeah, I don't have a question so much as I do a statement. Mm -hmm. It's about your belief and perception. Mm -hmm. We continue in the world to use the term race. Mm -hmm. No one knows what it is. Mm -hmm. No one. You know, and we, it's eugenics is what we perceive it to be, what we believe it to be, but there's no definition of race. We know it's a fabricated definition. Mm -hmm. So the language also gets to be important in terms of how we view the world. No one, no one living or dead knows what race is. Mm -hmm. you know? So again, language, context, belief, perception Matters. doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Since that was a comment, we'll take a question. <laughs> last, uh, last question. Hi, my name is Diana. I'm a first year um, master planning student at USC. And I'm just wondering how do you think like martial law translated into like gang junk and junction zones in South LA? Can you repeat the question? I heard okay. martial law. Yeah. Did I hear oh. martial law correctly? Yes, yeah, so okay. one of the key things that happened in the riots was like the creation of martial law mm -hmm. in order to um, stop the unrest, you know? Um, and I'm just wondering like most of the areas that were under martial law became um, um, injunction zones for like gangs and restrictions zones. So I'm just wondering what you guys think about that. I, I guess I could pontificate on that question, but I will tell you it would be grounded in nothing. So I, I think that, I, I don't know if Meg has comments, it's a little bit outside of something that I can address directly. Yeah, I'm not sure about like the direct impact of the law. Again, I'm not, yeah, I'm not as um, versed on that, but I can tell you gangs are definitely still very prevalent um, and definitely affect schools and communities. Um, and that's where another, you know, why, again, my passion is in education, that if we can, and then also bridging um, communities. So, for example, we recently uh, took a busload of 50 parents and students to go visit UC Santa Barbara, and some of our parents said that was their first time they've ever left South LA. Um, or even metropolitan LA, and they were just, they were amazed, and they, their eyes were open, because when we talk about college, to a lot of our families, it's, they don't even know how to envision, like, what is that? Like, what do I even put in my mind when you talk about college? 
um, or other job opportunities out there for the families that are outside of what they know. And so that gives them something different so that they don't just think that gangs is the only way to go or whatever else you know they see in their neighborhoods that, again, hope and vision and opportunity, but they need to experience it. And we need to bridge those communities by taking them out and, and letting them see what else is out there.